Please join us in welcoming Mark Hurd via live video. Well, good, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. I think uh, uh, great to be with you. Uh, you probably have uh, at least two questions. Why the heck is this guy in California at three in the morning Pacific time and not in London? And um, I'm actually going to explain that to you. I was traveling on my way to London, and I actually didn't have my passport. Um, that usually is not a problem because anywhere in the United States, you typically can go to one of many locations and just get a passport uh, so that you can travel. They need your driver's license, a little bit of data, make sure it's you, all of this. Um, but we have a thing here called a government shutdown. And it turns out that process is shut, is shut down. So I couldn't get through it. And that's why I'm here via satellite. So I know we all think we have various problems in various countries in the world. We certainly have ours uh, uh, here. And I apologize on behalf of the shutdown uh, and uh, my passport or lack thereof to not be with you in person. Second, you might have a question of, how does that guy get a Starbucks at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, Pacific time? And the answer to that is they got to be a great customer um, and you got to know people. And, you know, we we're lucky to have both occur. And therefore, I got a Starbucks so I could be with I could have it with me uh, as I present to you today. So anyway, let's uh, let's get started. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about a few things. First, um, what's really going on in the macro economy uh, and what those trends are uh, and how they look, because I think it's important to sort of understand um, how the trends are politically so that we 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 talk about how that affects I.T. So. Um, so if we go through what that what that means, we'll talk about those macro trends. We'll talk about the acceleration of cloud adoption. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about even though cloud adoption is still not mature by any means, what comes next after cloud? Um, we'll talk about some of the uh, successes in the cloud a bit. But then there's been some predictions that uh, that we've done over the years. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how those have worked out and then perhaps even make a couple new ones before we close up. All right. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the globe. Um, and, is, uh, you know, we all have various issues around the globe. But let me try to explain sort of economically what's happening to us. The economy is roughly a little less than $80 uh, trillion. Um, IT is a very small percentage of it, about 3% of worldwide GDP is, uh, is, is IT. Now, you can't do much of the rest of, of the GDP without the IT portion, but g people generally think IT is, is bigger than it is. Now, I've excluded uh, telecom out of this, so this is really just IT. Now, IT splits into two sections. One is consumer IT, and the other is sort of what we're all in, which is B2B IT or business IT. And this, I think, will be the first year where we'll see the consumer IT is probably a little bit bigger than business IT. Consumer IT has been growing 20 plus percent. It's been doing that uh, for a while. Um, and you see it in all the devices we have and all the applications that we've got. Business IT not only is is probably for the first time smaller, but the mix of the, of the two spends is very different. Most of what goes on in business IT, company IT budgets, are primarily maintenance. So if you will, you know, sort of 80 percent plus 84, 85 percent of most budgets are, are, are maintenance, keeping the current stuff running. Most applications, like it or not, are old. Average application, for example, in this country is over 20 years old. So even though the spends are equal, they're not really equivalent in terms of their impact uh, on the various market. Lots of innovation at the consumer layer, not as much innovation at the business layer. Uh, now, you've also got m uh, various political activities uh, going on at the same time, and you all see that, whether it's uh, the impact of Brexit, uh, whether it's the issues that you see going on between trade between China and the U.S. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in a second, because certainly one of the big battlegrounds 
Bounds that's going to go forward is, is going to be about data, it's going to be about cyber, it's going to be about AI, and, and we're going to talk about that. And it's going to be bigger than just, um, how would I say it, the implications on, on what we do for a living every day. I mean, just for example, the United States um, spends uh, over $700 billion, less than $800 billion, but in that range uh, on defense. Most of all that is on physical defense, um, whether that be aircraft carriers, airplanes, etc. cetera. Uh, the Chinese budget is actually materially, materially smaller than the U.S. budget, but much more of their spend goes into virtual defense, goes into digital defense, or perhaps some guys, somebody could argue digital offense. Uh, much more spending on cyber, much less spending on defense. So there's bigger implications around technology than simply what it goes on in B2B IT and and, and B to CIT. So a little bit of background uh, on that. Let's uh, let's move forward. Um, so the disruption that we see is 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 constant. Uh, technology, I, I, I'm here to tell you, is going to become a differentiator. Not just the data is the key assets for you to own. For example, most of the data in the world is today owned by two companies, uh, Facebook and Google. Uh, data, as it comes out long run, will be important for businesses to own. You're not going to want to use somebody else's data. You're going to want to own, mature, and, and, and develop and create a differentiator with your own data. Uh, virtual assets long run, I gave you one example in defense a second ago, will win over physical resources. Uh, cyber teams are, are every bit the new future. Now, for example, if you read uh, the latest five-year plan, uh, from the Chinese government. Um, they make a very clear statement. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about trade between the U.S. and China. Uh, I'm not one that thinks it's going to be very easy to work out. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that is, is, is their ambitions are, are very similar between the two economies. And they call out specifically AI. It's very important to lead in AI, to be differentiated in AI, to be the best in AI. That's called out in the Chinese five-year plan. Plan. So as you look at the implications on, <clears throat> on STEM and engineering, um, the implications of all that are tremendous in terms of, uh, in terms of engineering talent and, and, of course, the implication long run, I think, for all of our businesses on driving innovation and improving long run productivity. All right, let's move forward. Now, before we go ahead, I thought what we'd do is maybe take a little bit of a look back. So historically... I did these predictions at Open World. Uh, Open World that was in California. I started doing this, you know, circa 2014, 2015. I made these uh, predictions. Um, you know, I'd say I got a fair amount, eh, fair, yeah, a lot of criticism um, that these were just wrong, um, you know, uh, didn't make sense. You know, I, I said things like 80% of the production apps will be in the cloud. And this was all circa uh, 2025. So, you know, I thought I gave myself a nice time horizon, 10 years. Uh, two SaaS suite providers would own 80% market share. Uh, corporate data centers would decrease by 80%. I won't read all of this to you, but but you can get a flavor and, you know, take a look at what, what I said and imagine that this was thought to be, you know, something between provocative and maybe some people even thought downright dumb um, as it related to where the IT market was headed. Let's uh, let's click let's click forward. So more predictions. So then I supplemented that by saying, you know, I've got uh, I've got more ideas. So if you didn't think I was dumb before, let me add to it by saying 50% of all enterprise data will be managed autonomously. Uh, so you know, again, think of the concept of self-driving and automation now coming to IT. That even these highly regulated industries that are, you know, overseen by by hundreds and thousands of regulators would move at least half their workloads uh, to the cloud, and that over 90% of all enterprise apps will feature um, integrated AI. Now, I've moved, if you see at the top, I've moved the horizon from 2025 into 2020. So I got more aggressive in it because if there was anything I was seeing from my 2014, 2015 predictions was that I was, I was right. Well, I'll come to that in a second. Um, but it was actually happening faster than, than I predicted. Let's, 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 let's push forward. So 
I like this part. This is where, you know, analysts and press, now you can see the time frames. This is two, three years later. 15 months, 80% of all IT budgets uh, will be committed to cloud apps and solutions. See, I told you that three years before. 80% of enterprises will shut down their traditional data centers by 2023. See, this is Gartner. By the way, I know there's Gartner people in the audience. I love Gartner, but again, I could have saved you some research if you'd have just Anyway, so I won't, I won't, I won't keep going with, with all of this. Um, so I talked about security as being the most secure. Now you can see what comes out of, of, of another analyst. The Oracle Cloud will be your most secure place for data. I just love this. So, so this is, uh, I love it because it, of course, you know, supports my uh, thesis of several years before. So analysts and press uh, agree with us, and so it's good to see that these directions that we've described are actually are actually transpiring. Let's uh, let's click forward. So the reality of all this is that cloud adoption is moving faster than predicted. Now, let me, let me try to give you context because one thing about being here in the Silicon Valley is that as we sit here this morning, um, the Silicon Valley is 22, I'm actually in the northern part of the Silicon Valley, um, but it's about 22, 23 miles long. It's about six miles wide. And it really, every you know, year or two invents a word that's going to solve all your problems. You know, all your problems will be solved by you know uh, big data. Uh, all your problems are going to be solved by you know data lakes. I don't know. Insert new name here, and and this problem virtualization. I mean, I can go through all these words over the years that we're going to solve all the problems in IT. And 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 frankly, they 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 move you know all of the time uh, because they really don't have legs. They're typically technology centric, um, and they typically have sort of a, it's sort of an idea, it's got a little bit of technology behind it that turns out not to really deliver tremendous sustainable value. That has not been true by cloud. Now, let me tell you why I believe that to be the case. Cloud is not just a technology. Cloud is a strategy, cloud is a business model, cloud is a strategy that has macroeconomic benefits that's just much bigger than just technology. It is truly the shift of, of spend and risk from your IT budgets or a company's profit and loss statement to the industry's R&D budget. It is truly the movement of innovation away from your staff or supplements to your staff through partners to the companies that you partners with uh, uh, R&D budget. These are, these are big fundamental changes in the marketplace. And if you go down what's happened over the past you know, 25 years in IT, and I will make this brief because I don't have enough time to talk to you about 25 years of history, but 25 years ago, there was really one company that, that really was the leader in every single category, technically, in our industry. And then about 25 years ago, that changed. That changed, and, and, and what happened was the Valley took technical leadership in every single layer of, if you will, of the IT stack, whether that be in, 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 in operating systems and databases and middleware and applications, et cetera, et cetera. But it didn't do it the same way that, that, that IBM had done it years and years before. It did it really in piece parts. And it created a new business model. It was a procurement business model where you'd buy this from this person, this from that person, another thing from another person, and you would then f glue all this together, almost like what kids would do with a Lego set. And, and this piece didn't exactly match with this piece, but you glued it all together and you made it work. As you dial forward 25 or 30 years, and you look forward to, you look at, did that work? What it's left us with is extremely complex, very heterogeneous environments that are very difficult to modernize, very difficult to upgrade, uh, very difficult, frankly, even to secure. And this is because of the plethora of configurations, the plethora of technologies that have, that have permeated all companies really around the planet. Cloud is an absolute disruptor to that. Cloud is in many ways a, 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 a bit of a deja vu to this vertical integration, optimization. Just to give you an example, uh, I, I don't, uh, let's take any big bank that's in, 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 in the UK. My guess would be they have perhaps a thousand, if not in excess of thousands of configurations of computers and technologies. In our cloud, we have one. One configuration, one OS, one database, one set of middleware technologies.
And, and so this is a very different operating model than we've ever seen before and a huge disruptor to what goes on in IT. That's why it is accelerating. That's why it is at the core of how the next, this generation of IT is gonna evolve. And cloud is foundational to what you're gonna see in modern, in modern business. Now, that still means we still have a lot to do in cloud based on my predictions, a lot to do. But let's talk about what's next. Really, it comes down to automation. And automation drives a couple things. And you're going to hear it termed in machine to machine. You're going to hear words like uh, 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 pattern matching, artificial intelligence, all of these words. But they really, at the core of it, are automating fundamental processes. And that does two things. It accelerates innovation and it increases productivity. Automation accelerates times to get things done. Things that humans can do that in some cases can't do, or if they can do, they takes long and long, a long time to do it. This now gets done by the computer. Automation will lead to the reduction of maintenance cost. Simply in some cases, maybe even eliminate them. It'll actually lead to the creation of higher paying jobs or higher value jobs. You'll hear a lot about how there are those that say that AI will be a disruptor to the economy in a negative way. It'll replace people who work at, uh, at hospitality organizations, whether those be a fast food restaurant or hotel, whatever it be, all those processes get automated. That's the elimination of jobs. You can imagine going through a fast food uh, or uh, getting a coffee, and there's actually no humans. Everything's automated. Those jobs get eliminated. I'll talk to you about that in a second because this actually, I believe, will be a creator of jobs, not an eliminator of jobs. Companies will actually, on top of it, will build new engagement models. Many of the processes by which you interact with companies or companies interact with their customers will now be, will now be automated. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. Next chart. Let me give you a couple examples. So, first example here is we, well, let me start, let me, I'm not gonna go through each one because let me just make sure, I think in the interest of time, I probably should uh, keep a reasonable cadence here. I'll give you a simple example like, like, like HR. So, I'll give you an example, we recruit about 20,000 people a year in our company. We recruit about 2,000 a year just off the US college campus, those being engineers and, and salespeople. How do we do that? I'm sure like your company, we, we have recruiters. We have recruiters, they physically go to the location, they, uh, they say hello, they search social media, they, they do all sorts of things, but typically, we're typically at the, I don't want to say the mercy, but at the, the individual recruiter's skills and capabilities to be able to recruit, and they do that through their instincts and their experiences to get the best talent that they possibly can. Well, imagine now if you had the benefit of everybody we'd hired over the past, pick a number of years, three years, four years, five years, six years, and you could understand every attribute of that candidate. You could understand the alignment of those attributes to their success at Oracle. We knew if a GPA mattered in terms of long-term success, we knew if a GPA from that school mattered in terms of long-term success, we knew if GPA in a certain major at a certain school translated to long-term success. We knew if a GPA from a certain school with a certain major with extracurricular activities, I could go through hundreds of these attributes. But now think about this. You know all of that. Now, it doesn't mean that history is a perfect predictor of the future. There still needs to be judgment. But that said, you now have the benefit of all of that knowledge and all of it's automated. And now it completely changes the way you recruit. Imagine the process of compensation. Imagine if you just knew all of the information about all of the changes in your workforce. And as you made adjustments to your compensation, instead of generic peanut butter spreading of compensation, you could bring it down to discrete work groups and discrete countries and discrete functions. And you could do it based on discrete market data. And you could do it in near real time. All of this becomes a reality. What if you could dynamically, what if you could ship things across an ocean get the lowest cost of logistics in your supply chain and dynamically allocate that inventory while it was en route. And what if I knew all that based on, and I won't go through more and more examples because it'll take me more time and I'll wind up getting too excited going through all of these use cases. But in the end, think about now that all of these with AI get automated. 
all of these now with AI, AI getting integrated directly into these applications. Let me make a point here. I do not believe AI will be a standalone, separate application. I believe it's a feature and a capability integrated with every application. Next chart. So, um, I shouldn't say this, but our predictions were roughly right. Um, customers using cloud and technology to accelerate growth, realize new innovation, and gain, product, gain productivity. Now, let's, uh, let's go forward. So let's talk about uh, some of the predictions that, uh, that we're making. By 2025, I am now saying all cloud apps, everyone will include AI. AI will be at the core. These cloud apps will further distance themselves from legacy applications. They're already distancing themselves from, from legacy applications. We can do things now that we could never do before. I think you will see, by the way, significant changes in user interfaces. I think user interfaces will all be all voice driven and integrated directly with, with, with digital assistants, with chatbots. AI will be pervasive. It will be woven into all of these apps and services. I think the same thing will be true for technologies like blockchain. I think there will be blockchain networks, but I think blockchain capabilities built into supply chain apps, built into even HR apps. I mean, I could go down again the same number of use cases I did before, but again, blockchain is a core feature of these applications. Next prediction. 85% of all interactions with customers, again, look at the date, date's important, 2025, with customers will be automated fundamentally change the relationship you have with suppliers. If you don't know that for most mobile phone companies, you know, 35%, 30% churn per year. Most of the time when you call to the call center, the people you're talking to are churning through the call center at 40 some percent per year. Most of the changes in service relationships last about three minutes. Three minute phone call from a third of your customers talking to people that generally, roughly speaking, half of them leave in the context of a year. What if that process now became automated? It actually knew everything the company knew. Not everything the person knew, but everything the company knew. We knew who was calling, why they were calling, what their history was, what sort of customer they were. All of this based on digital assistance, which by the way, will both lower your cost, but just if not more importantly, It'll improve the quality of the interaction as you, as you, as you do it. All right, next, next prediction. Uh, AI will power 85% of all these customer interactions. So these interactions will prove, as I mentioned, the service levels and engagement. So retailers will be able to create a personal experience on any channel. I mean, today you go to a website, you get many, many things pushed at you. This will now change dramatically the ability now to personalize these experiences. I mentioned earlier hotels that can run 24 seven um, without people. So actually you can even think of the fact that now as I talked to, as I talked a little earlier, being able to get something at three in the morning, you can now get everything at three in the morning. Everything's now automated. The, extra, the incremental cost really is the electricity to run the site. There is no cost for extra people as, as you go forward. All, all industries are gonna find new ways now, innovative ways, to connect to their customer with new ways to lower their costs and increase their productivity. 60% of the IT jobs, and this gets to the point I made earlier, have not been invented yet. So, you know, AI changes the productivity equation. It actually gets a lot of work off the backs of companies. Automation addresses more complex and time-consuming problems. Some of the examples I gave you with, with uh, uh, HR examples and recruiting, supply chain examples that typically have hundreds and hundreds of people doing analytical work uh, in some of these big companies and now all gets automated. But I'm here to tell you, I don't think automation replaces all these jobs, but actually will create new ones. There'll have to be analyst scientists and engineers to be able to help drive the AI. A lot of this will be bot-driven, robot. And so there'll be a supervisor for the robots. Just like all of us have a boss today, robots need a boss. Somebody will have to make sure the robot is actually performing. Human to machine UX specialists. So the ability now to create different and, different, different and more uh, easier to use user experiences. 
these are today very few people in this in this line of work which will explode in terms of job capabilities. And I could go through the rest of all of these, but the reality is this is going to become a very, very competitive hot market for quality young people to enter the marketplace in. And it's going to be driven by the advances in AI and the need for someone to help create, drive, innovate, manage, and lead these environments. So most of the jobs in IT that we think of today, more than half of them haven't been invented yet. They're on the horizon to be invented. Next chart. So I think, you know, in, in summary, that start with the, the cloud, as a, again, not just a technology, but as a business model, as an approach. It's irrefutable, um, and it's really at the foundation of everything we do. I do not think what we just talked about replaces it. I think it supplements it. I think it complements it. The next in cloud is acceleration of productivity and innovation. AI and other technologies will now be features integrated into these, these cloud applications and platforms that will now drive new innovation and lower costs while we do it. Autonomous database software, you're going to hear a lot about that at Open World here, will be, and so these things like uh, now the, the, the labor that it takes just to simply patch a database. As many of you may know, by the time we release a patch, um, it may take as much as a year to, for those patches to get implemented through our database uh, on-premise user base. You may ask why. Uh, it's hard. It's hard for all the reasons I described about what's happened over the last 25 years of layers of complexity being built up in IT. This now can, can all be automa automated, where you now can patch with autonomous database instantaneously. You can optimize instantaneously. You can manage instantaneously. Program, I gave the example, let me just give you this simple example. I hope it's simple. Uh, we bought a company uh, called NetSuite, well-known company. They're, they're uh, uh, an applications company. They've had tremendous success. Um, NetSuite is an Oracle database customer, and we're an Oracle database customer before Oracle bought them um, several years ago. NetSuite, uh, over the 15, 18 years of their, of their, of their lifespan, uh, built roughly 9,000 indexes to the database, 9,000. That created, obviously, performance led by one of the, I mean, some of the best engineers in the applications market, very knowledgeable of, of Oracle. So it took years and years to do all this. They then ran a test, a benchmark, on autonomous database. Think about this. The database, the autonomous database with no human interface, or no human interaction, wrote 6,000 indexes, nobody touched it, and got 7%, roughly speaking, better performance. Out of the box. Out of the box. Think about that in the conjunction of, so no labor, no programming, auto patching. Obviously, that improves security dramatically. Think about the fact that no DBAs, those DBAs can now move on to managing those bots, can now move on to many of these higher order tests that we, we described. So this, this is going to drive the market as we go forward. And I think in the end, flip that barrier. Remember that barrier I told you about this 80% uh, plus of budgets that are spent on, on, on maintenance as opposed to innovation. All of these things we're talking about, flip that so that you can now focus on innovation, get most of, if you will, the hard, heavy lifting plumbing, automated, integrated, tested, and into the cost base of the R&D budgets of, of the industry. So that's, that's where we think, we think the market is headed and how we believe uh, things are moving. And so with that, I will um, say thank you Again, I'm uh, very sorry I couldn't be there in person. You now know why. Um, and I hope you have a, uh, first, thanks for spending your time with us, and you have a great uh, rest of, uh, of Oracle Open World. Thank you uh, very much.